I think we are in the fourth uh, part of our series. Uh, if you haven't seen the first three parts, please uh, check it in the description below. Uh, in the description, I, we've uh, put the links for the first three videos. So if you haven't seen it, please do check it out. Then you can follow this fourth one better. So in the first uh, two parts, I introduced you all about telescopes. In the third one, I've, I went a little bit more deep dive, in, deep dive into how we use these instrumentation and why what do we do around it but i've still focused only on optical uh, uh, telescopes and optical science so in this video i want to explain a little bit more around other wavelengths let's <clears throat> explain a bit more around uh, other wavelengths uh, what science can we do and what kind of instruments are there and things like that so right now i'll focus a little bit more on my own personal expertise which is around longer wavelengths which is infrared near mid infrared and uh, also radio and sub millimeter wavelengths so i'll explain a little bit more around there again in the more perspective of star and planet formation but i'll also brief up about what other uh, science that can be done other than just star and planet formation so uh, now all that we have seen is optical. Now if you look at it from a more of a science perspective, right? Most of the optical light is just emitted by some source, which is in most in in, in all the cases or in most of the cases, it's just purely uh, a star, right? Or some emission source, which is typically it emits because of some thermonuclear reaction or something, which is basically uh, a star, right? Now um, not always everything is in uh, optical wavelengths. Now there is like a whole universe if you go beyond optical wavelengths. So let's go in the higher energy I could see accretion. I can see high energy things that are going on. Uh, like uh, I, I can check out a, about accretion around a black hole, accretion around a star. All these things I can check in high energy astrophysics or uh, neutron stars and everything. Now um, but let's go more towards the lower uh, uh, frequencies and longer wavelengths uh, science behind. So uh, let's look into uh, infrared and radio this time. I'll go a bit more detail in later videos. So please stay tuned. Please do subscribe uh, the channel. You will uh, get more such content in the future. So uh, what can we do? Now let's go back to my own personal favorite field of expertise which is around star formation and planet formation now even planets let's take our planet right earth now if if let's say i'm an alien i'm looking into our solar system what do i see i'll see our sun which is an average yellow dwarf it's a middle-aged star located in some remote average corner of an average galaxy called milky way it is not that something that is as spectacular as most of the stars that we look at on average right so most of the stars that i have worked with most of the stars that i look at they're more a bit more spectacular so now if i look at if, if i'm an alien I'm, I'm looking at this average yellow dwarf star called sun right and i want to look at it and i want to look into the planets what will i see i will basically see uh i, I will basically only see uh the star and if I have a powerful enough telescope I will see Jupiter to the max because if I'm only going to do optical science the only source of optical light in our solar system is our sun there's no one else now um, Jupiter is big enough so which means it will also reflect a little bit so if I have a powerful enough telescope I might be able to resolve Jupiter but if I want to look into earth with I'm just giving it okay alien technology might be like you know way advanced of us but let's look at uh, the, let's say that okay they are as advanced as us and with what with what we have in hand what can we do I want to look at earth or earth like planets around other stars I, we are aliens ourselves right for other earth like planets so for our uh, so if, if I need to look if I need to identify super earths I need to uh, I need to like actually uh, look at it not in optical wavelengths anymore because our planet is 
a super small if, if you look if I think you would have know, seen it already even heard a lot about it there are like planets that are much bigger than Earth Earth is not the biggest planet in the solar system right there are a lot of the planets Saturn Uranus Neptune they are all massive as compared to Earth so which means uh, even the inner planets like we are not like as big to scale we are almost similar size to Venus slightly bigger than Mars and Mercury so if I really have to look into Earth, optical is not the way to go, right? With our current technology, what we have at hand, optical is not the way to go. So what can we do? Then the other way of doing, looking at it is through infrared. Now, for infrared uh, light, uh, now wh why infrared would work? Now, the average temperature on Earth is around 27 degrees Celsius. I mean, it can go up and down, our summers are pretty hot here and winters can be really cold. So, thanks to global warming and whatnot, but our average temperature is around 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. It's around 300 Kelvin. Now, 300 Kelvin is basically around uh, mid-infrared. If an object is at 300 Kelvin, it will emit more in mid-infrared. So, if, let's say, our eyes work in mid-infrared instead of optical, we will never have night time. We will, it, uh, uh, like 24 hours, we'll only see daylight, right? Because it's not the sun anymore. Our planet itself will start glowing at those wavelengths. So, which means, if I look at our solar system now in mid-infrared, and I have a really good resolution, I can, you know, do some tricks like what I explained earlier. If I do those direct imaging tricks in mid-infrared, I have a high chance of spotting Earth. Because Earth will emit a lot in mid-infrared. Now, I'm an emitter rather than a reflector, right? So, if I emit, I'm going to emit more photons. Rather than if I reflect, I'm going to only... It depends on what we call as the albedo of the planet. So, uh, yeah. So, essentially, uh, the... Uh, so, if, if I look into Earth, I need to look into... If I have to look into like planets like this, I have to have a better chance of finding them in infrared. Not just uh, exoplanets, but also planet formation. Now, what happens after a star forms is that you basically have a star at the center and the, the, this is a young star that has just formed. Now, typically the star only eats up 90% of the material. So, typically how a star forms is that I have a molecular cloud of gas. If you want to see a similar molecular cloud again without a telescope I'll, I'll give you a really good suggestion like Rho of or uh, um, or yeah any of these other ones Rho of or Eta Carina these are all star forming regions they are big enough you can actually see it without a telescope but you need to have good enough sensitivity on your eye you need to be in a really dark side to be able to see it it's really hard to see even in a good dark side but you can still see another star forming region uh, so, if you, uh, one easy constellation that everybody can easily spot is the constellation of Orion. The way to spot Orion is, uh, Orion is typically in the night sky around winter, that is like around November, December, January, you will see Orion. Now, um, what you can, uh, w uh, the easy way to spot Orion is that you have three stars in a line, there will be two stars on the top, two stars on the bottom. And you'll see some fuzzy blob over here. It's what we call as what we call as the Orion Sword. This part is called as the Orion's Belt, and it's like the Orion Sword. And this is actually something called as the Messier 42 or the Orion Nebula. Now, in this Orion Nebula, you have certain star-forming regions. So you can see it even without a telescope. If you can spot these three stars, just look a little bit below these three stars, you'll see some fuzzy object over there. Now, these are typically molecular clouds. Now, these molecular clouds start collapsing because they cool down and thermodynamics says as they cool down, uh, the, uh, the pressure basically like uh, goes more inwards and it's, it increases, which means they start cooling down and they start collapsing on their own weight. And as they collapse, they compress. And as they compress, thermonuclear reaction starts. And then, voila, you have your first baby star. But the star doesn't take 100% of the material over here. It will only take 
around 90% of what is available for the star. The rest 10% on average forms a disk around the star. Now, why is it a disk? It's because of uh, conservation of angular momentum. So I don't want to go into the details of it. Maybe in another video, I'll go into the nuts and bolts of why is it a disk. We'll look into how the conservation of angular momentum plays over here. But for now, just take my word for it, but you will see a disk. Now, this is what we call as a protoplanetary disk. So, protoplanetary disk. Now, uh, this protoplanetary disk has a lot of dust and gas around it and they start sticking together <coughs> and forming something called as a planetesimal and then they accumulate more mass, they start having their own gravity, so they start attracting more gas around it to form the planet, like say for example, what we are standing on top of. So it went through all these phases and then, well, you're standing on one such rock. Uh, now the point with uh, the protoplanetary disk, right, if I want to look into planet formation, uh, now around the star, the star is like, let's say it's like a typical sun type of star, right? Uh, around the K type stars. We call them T tau rise. Now T tau rise, like on, on an average T tau rise stars, they have like a surface temperature of around 6000 Kelvin. So that means around here you'll have optical emissions. And as you go further and further out, the temperature drops. As the temperature drops, again, if we go back to our uh, black body law, like the Wien's law and uh, so on. Uh, I think it's the Stefan's law, yeah, sigma t to the power four. So the, uh, the as the temperature goes down, uh, the m more and more longer wavelengths or infrared or radio light starts dominating over optical wavelengths. Infrared, radio and so on, they start dominating over optical wavelengths. So which means, Typically, Earth kind of planets form around like, you know, 1 AU or what we call as the Goldilocks zone, right? If I need to look into the Goldilocks zone, if I look into Earth, if I look at Earth, like Goldilocks zone is like not too hot, not too cold, just right. So that's around 25, 30 degrees Celsius. So that is, as I said, as I said in the uh, first half of the video, it's around 300 Kelvin, which is in mid infrared. So typically around 10 micron is where it peaks. So if I need to look into this part, right, uh, I need to look into mid infrared. Now, which means, okay, and I can't use my average DSLR to do this job because a typical CCD is made out of silicon, but in this case, we use something called as uh, nickel cadmium telluride thing. You don't have to remember this. Uh, I remember it because I, I was working on it. So these detectors, they, are, they work like, they are equivalent to optical cameras. The way they work is similar. Now with this, I would be able to see this part of the protoplanetary disk in a much better detail. Or if I look into an exoplanet, I can see it in much better detail in infrared. Not just that, like uh, I can also, uh, I was also working with teams where they looked into infrared emissions around the center of our Milky Way, around the supermassive black hole at the center of Milky Way. They have seen a lot of star formation happening over there. They've also seen a few other signatures of accretion in the, in, the, in, the, in the infrared. Like typically you have different lines. You have the passion lines, alpha lines, bracket, gamma lines. So typically like bracket gamma emissions are like a signature of uh, accretion. So we usually look at it in, in mid infrared and mid infrared and near infrared is always a treasure trove for the night sky for us. So for this, we typically have uh, instruments that can handle it. But then again, we have to account for one giant source that we are sitting on, which is our planet. This is one giant source of mid infrared light. So typically infrared telescopes are in outer space. There are also ground based mid infrared instruments. But typically we used to have like uh, uh, a background uh, subtractor and so on where we cancel out the thermal emission from sun and uh, from earth and uh, so on and and with this we can check it out now from an instrument perspective they work similar to that of a optical telescope the only difference is that in an optical one i use the charge coupled device whereas in uh, 
in, in uh, the case of uh, infrared, we use nickel cadmium telluride. The way it works is different. In charge coupled devices, it's basically like the difference between the uh, uh, in, in the, in the silicon basically it starts emitting an electron every time there is a photon hitting on it. Whereas here, it's basically electrons, like we call it the valence band and the conduction band. If uh, in nickel cadmium telluride, if an infrared photon hits, it pushes the elect uh, uh, electron there, which means I'm going to have a current out of it. And if I can measure the current, boom, I know how, how much light has hit on uh, in the first place. That means I can measure it more accurately. I don't have to do, as what I explained in the previous video, I don't have to do the fudging around. So I can have more accurate measurements and I can do better science with this. Now, in, in, now speaking of infrared, I will quickly start uh, introduce you to some a concept called interferometry. Maybe some of you might have heard it, some of you might not have heard it. The idea with interferometry is if I take interference is that if I take any wave, any two waves, okay, uh, essentially what happens is if they hit, so if I have like some waves traveling, like if you drop two stones on a water, they start emanating waves. And some of the waves will cancel each other and some waves at some point you'll have a bright spot. So if I take an image of two lights hitting each other that way, I'm going to see on an image something called as an interference pattern. That is, I'll see fringes, bright and dark bands. You might actually see it uh, in a lot of other situation around you. Sometimes like it's not typically interference, it's something called birefringence. Uh, if you look into say a net, a super close net, sometimes if you look through it at the right angle, you might see some fringes around it. Now, if I plot this, like based on the dis the the contrast between the bright and the dark fringe rays, right, I can identify what kind of object it is in the front first. Or even from this, I can reconstruct how the object can look like. Now, in my earlier video, I, I briefly explained to you about um, Interf uh, interferometry in telescopes where instead of using one giant telescope I can use multiple smaller telescopes separated by a distance and it will effectively work as one giant telescope so what I do is I have like two telescopes with me separated by a baseline B now however small this can be you know one meter to one meter telescope one meter wide telescope because I've separated them by I don't know 100 meters these two, if I take the light from these two and it make interfere them in a lab and look at the fringes and reconstruct the image, the image will be as good as looking at it, looking at it through a telescope which is as wide as 100 meters. Of course, there are some limitations on it, but uh, the more the telescopes I have, the better will be my image. But essentially, this is how it works. Now, this is what we call as interferometry. So uh, I would have said like I would have mentioned about this telescope a lot because I used to work for this telescope called VLTI, Very Large Telescope Interferometer. It essentially does this. They, what, what we have is we have four telescopes of 8 meters in diameter and also six telescope of about 1.6 meters in diameter, which we call as the auxiliary telescope and the unit telescopes. And they are all separated by a distance somewhere from 40 meters to about 150 meters. And uh, the way we combine the lights through all these different telescopes, we can construct a really good image. Now, uh, say I use, I use that to look into the inner details of how planets form around, say, the habitable zone and so on. So this is like what we do with interferometry. So based on the fringes, I, get, I can reconstruct the image from these fringes. I'll explain it more detail in a later video how it works, but I just wanted to quickly drop interferometry into this entire picture. So in infrared, we typically do a lot of interferometry and we um, interferometry and direct imaging as well. So yeah, I just wanted to quickly explain about this. Now other than, uh, now keep in mind about interferometry because I want to open up a whole new wavelength which is radio. Now, radio wavelengths, uh, you might have heard about it, like we use it a lot, radio wavelengths in, um, in whatever, radar communication and everything.
but also uh, there are like a lot of objects that emits radio waves now as i said right the temperature as the temperature goes lower or few other physical processes step in you it starts emitting light in long at longer and longer wavelengths so there can be wavelengths as long as 1 meter the, those are our, so excuse me they, those are our radio wavelengths now uh, typical so there are like a lot of radio telescopes around in india there is uh, one in pune called the giant meter radio wave telescope there are few here in tamil nadu in uti there are, there is also one in karnataka in a place called gauri bidanur uh, there are a lot of the radio telescopes so there is one in effelsberg in germany one in uk there is a, the ska the square kilometer array in uh, africa and you've got the parks telescope in australia so these are all different radio telescopes so what can we do now how a radio telescope typically functions the concept of it is essentially the same the radio telescope concept on the nuts and bolts of it it's essentially same as what we have for an optical telescope but there is a slight difference over there now what a radio telescope does is a radio telescope is nothing but an average radio but with a really powerful antenna that's that's how i would always call a radio telescope as uh, it's an average radio uh, receiver that you have but with a really powerful antenna an optical telescope is also the same thing it's an average camera but with a really powerful lens it's similar on radio telescope well, how a radio telescope functions is i have the same con concave surface just like a concave mirror in a newtonian telescope or a reflecting telescope i have a concave surface have my radio waves hitting it from infinity from my source i focus it instead of a secondary uh, mirror i have something called as a secondary collector over here this is where the signals are then collected and the electromagnetic waves are then converted into electric signals and then i amplify the signal i process it or i record it i can do whatever i want with it now uh, these are how radio telescopes work so essentially if you look into a radio telescope it's just one giant antenna it can be a dish or sometimes it can also be like you know a bidirectional antenna like the old school tv antennas the yagi antennas and so on all of them can function as a radio telescope in fact i'll i can actually give you one lead like say if you have you know the old school radios at home you know the old school 2 in 1 and radios at home which doesn't just work in fm or am but they also have <clears throat> something called as the medium wave and the short wave ones in old school days we had the madras one station which was which used to run in medium wave and stuff now these are typically like you know uh uh yeah i think 7 megahertz or something uh so you can basically use this uh to observe uh You, you can receive emissions from outer space as well <clears throat> so if you use that radio around i think it's around 21 megahertz uh, in 21 megahertz uh, you can and if you have a good antenna or if you have like you know the old school cable tv coaxial cable with you you can create a massive uh, yagi antenna or a bidirectional antenna in your terrace take two wires connected to your old school radio i've done it in the past you can record the signal like you know all modern day uh, thing you can record the signal and you can do wonders with it now where radio waves like i just wanted to close this video with one science use case from radio uh, and then i'll explain a bit more around uh, radio astronomy uh in the later video so one science case there are a lot of things we also use radio telescopes to there's this project called seti search for extraterrestrial intelligence we try to identify radio signals that are coming from outer space uh which has some you know signs of intelligent life so we also transmit uh signals to outer space to say hey we are intelligent beings hopefully uh uh we are intelligent enough for the universe but yeah we say hey we are we are a species over here please listen to us now seti looks for similar signals through re using radio telescopes in radio also we do interferometry we collect signals from multiple telescopes recently there was an image for uh, uh, of the event horizon around our around the black hole in uh, at the center of our galaxy the supermassive black hole sagittarius a star 
uh, for that they have used uh, interfered like they, they have combined the light from three telescopes from three different continents together in radio you can do it in optical infrared you can't in radio i can record the light i can record the wave and i can do it i'll explain it later in the next videos uh, but one other science case that fascinates me the most and i'll close the video with that uh, is basically uh, the concept of something called as pulsars now pulsars were discovered in 1980s by a person called jocelyn bell so she was looking at uh, looking at the radio emissions of certain stars and she was recording them and she was just plotting like the radio emissions from certain certain objects and she noticed that certain objects had you know a frequent beeps so it was making like boop 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 and the point about these beeps where they were so periodic like the, the period between two beeps were so accurate that even the most accurate atomic clock on the planet is not accurate enough for this so initially they thought this is not a sign of uh, so this was detected by a radio telescope in uk and she initially felt okay this can't be something natural natural anything that is natural can't be this perfect it must be a sign of some intelligent life form but uh, later on they figured out that it's not uh, an, it's not something um, alien made it's basically a natural thing called pulsars which is basically a star that shoots out material and they spin rapidly so it's almost like you know an intergalactic lighthouse so it shoots out material and also radio waves high energy materials and radio waves that comes from this high energy emissions you can have synchrotron emissions that can come out of this and uh, basically radio telescopes picked it up as they spin around and she got these frequent beeps that came out of it and these are what we call as pulsars so this is like one application of radio telescope so i'll go into more detail about radio telescope in our future videos so thanks for watching all our videos till now please do subscribe uh, manigandan institute of physics thanks to manigandan sir for this opportunity and uh, the previous videos are uh, the links are in the description below and please do subscribe the channel thank you